Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patty Limerick. I'm the faculty director of the Center of the American West, and I would like to welcome you to the fourth program in the University of Colorado's Vietnam War 50th Anniversary Commemoration. This our commemoration is part of a larger project created by Congress and coordinated by the Department of Defense to address the history of the Vietnam War and to recognize Vietnam veterans. The Center of the American West has several co-sponsors for this evening's program, uh, the University of Colorado Boulder Student Veterans Association. I think the members of these various groups should do something. They should wave their hands when your group is mentioned. Or do just, uh, not an over-the-top way necessarily, but just a, a proud of your organization as you sh uh, certainly are. So, okay, so I'm going back. I'm starting again here. So our co-sponsors, the University of Colorado Boulder Student Veterans Association. Now wave your hands, sir. Do you, you're supposed to be out here. Woo! <laughs> okay. We didn't really practice this beforehand, and so, but it's going fine. It's going very well. Uh, and then the student uh, at CU Veteran Services, and that I guess would, you could raise your hand if you wanted to, but there you are. Okay. Uh, and the American Music Research Center, the Conference on World Affairs, the International Affairs Program, and the History Department. I want especially to thank the Center of the American West staff who are around here. There's one right there, and but especially Kurt Gutjahr who really pulls things together for us. So, um, and also, good heavens, my partner in all these commemoration activities, Stu Elliott, who already, who should raise his hand again, because that's a, been a very helpful role in all kinds of ways. The lecture tonight will be filmed and broadcast by C-SPAN. Uh, Stu, I think, thought it was really for us that that was going to be happening, but it turns out it's actually our distinguished visitor who has caused that to happen. Uh, after the lecture and at the end of the question and answer session, please stay seated for a few more minutes in your seats uh, for a ceremony, or a kind of ceremony of veteran recognition. We will ask all the Vietnam veterans present to come up so we can present them with lapel pins, thanking them for their service. But if any Vietnam veterans would prefer to remain seated, they can do so, and these uh, very alert young people will find them and give them their, their pins. So now. Oh, uh, yes, uh, a, a Marine, of all things, has reminded me to tell everyone to turn off your cell phones. And if I say that just as a professor, no one's going to pay attention to that. But if I say a Marine told me to tell you to turn off your cell phones, now we have authority in the room here. So, so um, turn off those cell phones. I am now have the privilege of introducing the speaker. William Adams grew up in Michigan and started his college career at Colorado College. He also nearly ended his college career at Colorado College with a freshman year that he describes with characteristic forthrightness as disastrous. He then enlisted in the Army in 1966 and did basic training at Fort Knox. The results of various standardized tests qualified him for officer candidate school, and he was soon commissioned as a second lieutenant in the artillery. He went on to the, uh, to the School of Warfare at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he was trained in language, counterinsurgency tactics, and special weapons. In May of 1968, he was sent to Vietnam as an advisor to a very small regional unit in the Mekong Delta. For a year, he worked with South Vietnamese militia units, primarily in combat operations. In May of 1969, he returned to the United States. William Adams went back to college, first at the University of Michigan, and then with a return to Colorado College. He went on <coughs> excuse me, to get a PhD in philosophy at the University of California at Santa Cruz, with the curious timing that I graduated with a BA in the spring of 1972 from the University of California at Santa Cruz, and in a sort of changing of the guard, to use a military <laughs> metaphor, uh, he arrived in the graduate program in the fall of 1972. Earlier in the day, I made invidious comparisons between our mascot, the banana slug, and Ralphie. And I'm not doing that tonight, because I think the slug suffers by comparison. So I'm sorry to admit that. We won't talk about that in Santa Cruz on our next reunion. Dr. Adams taught at Stanford and then moved to Wesleyan University in 1988, where he was the executive assistant <coughs> to the president. He moved on to become president of Bucknell University and then the president of Colby College. 
In 2014, he was appointed as the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, where he has demonstrated both originality and steadiness in making the case for the value of the humanities in civic life and in building programs connecting the humanities and veterans. In a dramatically less significant development for the National Endowment for the Humanities, I was confirmed by the Senate for the National Council on the Humanities in the late fall of 2015, and so it was my great honor and great pleasure to serve as a council member with Dr. Adams as my inspiration and my leader. I did observe earlier today that following is probably not my strong suit in character, so when I, <laughs> and for the national audience, referred to him as my leader, that is quite a thing where somebody who usually does not... Well, <laughs> Let's not go there too much, but taking orders, that's not probably uh, where I thrive. So, but for him, I will take orders. Uh, well, there's other people in the room. I won't call them out, but there are other. I just took Jack's orders on the cell phone, so there's other people I will do that for. Uh, but this, it really, I'm trivializing a really important point. It was a great privilege to, to serve on the council with Dr. Adams as my, as my leader. The people, whose the people in the room whose professional life requires them to attend meetings will understand the intensity and depth of the compliment that I'm about to pay Dr. Adams. Here we go. When he is chairing a day and a half long National Council on the Humanities meeting, the time flies by and the council members are visibly sad when forced to leave Dr. Adams' company, stop meeting, and go home. Those of you who attend meetings, is that how you feel at the end of a day and a half meeting? No, you feel quite joyful as you um, scamper out, but not us. Dr. Adams is a bicyclist and fisherman, and he is well supplied with family ties to Colorado. He is um, a very big fan of Tom Waits, and he actually uses the word fanatic rather than fan. I guess fan might be short for fanatic, I'm not sure there. And he once flew from Maine to Jacksonville, Florida, because that was the only concert venue for which he was able to get Tom Waite concert tickets. He is also a credentialed fan of Roy Orbison, just one sign among many of his impeccable taste. Having stepped down um, as NEH chair on May 23rd, 2017 of this, well, this year, he is now a senior fellow at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and he is also returning to the scholarly world and to his book on the French philosopher Maurice Muriel. Merleau-Ponty. Merleau. Oh, I mistyped that. Well, that didn't help at all. I knew I would have anxiety over pronouncing a French name, and I did. And mistyping it certainly didn't help with that problem. So. Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, and the painter of Paul Cézanne. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. Uh, so much of what looks like ethnocentricity in the world is just anxiety about pronunciation. I would just like to make that, that clear, since I just demonstrated it. So, shifting uh, here, join me in welcoming William Adams, who will be speaking tonight on comradeship, moral injury, and the legacy of the Vietnam War, the need for the humanities to close the gap between the veterans and their nation. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for those uh, very generous words. And what I love about Patty is that she puts everyone immediately at ease with her wonderful sense of humor. So thank you for that and for the introduction. I want to uh, express thanks also to Kurt Guchar for his help in getting me here. It was not easy, but Kurt did a great job, and other members of the staff uh, of the center, members of the Boulder community, thank you for coming, and especially to veterans here tonight. I'm very grateful that you're here. I know you have lots of things to do and lots of obligations, but that you would be here is, is very meaningful to me. So thank you all a great deal. I was eager to come here for a couple of reasons. Patty's compelling personality, first and foremost. I have to tell you that Patty was, right from the beginning, a spectacular member of our National Council, and I want her colleagues at Boulder to know how she does you proud uh, in Washington at these meetings. She's been a wonderful member of the Council, and it was a great honor of mine to be able to swear her in at her first Council uh, meeting. But in addition, I wanted to experience this program that she's built here um, at the Center of the, West, of the American West, honoring, commemorating the Vietnam War. I have traveled a lot of, to a lot of places around the country. This is the first such university program I've witnessed and been part of, and so I was very eager 
to come and know more about it. This is also a time, as many of you know, of many different kinds of Vietnam anniversaries. They all circulate around the number 50, uh, which is pretty disturbing to me, uh, having to come to terms with that number um, as I've participated in some of these. One of them included the congressional celebration or commemoration of the war a few years ago in Washington, which I was invited to attend and did attend, a very interesting event. But there are many other things going on around the country all around this 50th anniversary, roughly, of various parts of the war. This has also been a time of personal recollection for me. I was uh, very pleased to be able to go to Vietnam in April with a very close friend of mine who was a Marine helicopter pilot. I'm going to talk a little bit about that trip in just a little bit. But it is, in addition to all these official anniversaries, a time of some uh, pretty intense personal reflection for me on the war. And last but not least, but very importantly, um, we at the National Endowment for the Humanities put a great deal of time and energy into programs for veterans and around the legacies of wars and conflicts in American history, the Standing Together program for veterans and for American historical awareness and understanding of America's involvements in various wars. So this uh, occasion uh, was a way for me to find, again, a chance to talk about the great work of NEH, and it's wonderful to be able to have a chance to do so with you. I want to do three or four very uh, straightforward, I hope, things tonight. I want to talk about some of the key legacies of the war and what it left to us as American citizens. I want to suggest some of the ways in which the humanities are central, important, fundamental to understanding uh, those legacies. And I want to, as the title advertises, I want to take a brief look at comradeship as a way of making sense of war and the experience of combat. And then I hope that we can have some time for discussion and questions, because I would really love to know what's on your minds and uh, what you're thinking about this period of uh, reflection on Vietnam and other issues involving veterans uh, and the military. The legacies of this war are many, fundamental, and terribly important. I'm going to talk about three or four in particular. And the first one I want to talk about is what the war did to Americans' understandings of the federal government. Many of you lived through this time, and you will recall, as I do, that for the very first time, at least in contemporary or recent modern American history, certainly in the 20th century, Vietnam became an occasion for many Americans to doubt in fundamental ways the veracity of the government and what it was telling them about this incredibly important episode in American life. One of the very important episodes in this was, of course, the release of the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg and the publication of those papers in the New York Times but there were many similar moments in which Americans confronted for the first time in many cases, and that was certainly true for me as a young man, the fact that the United States government was not telling its citizens the truth about what was happening in Vietnam. Now remember, we were coming out of World War II, a time of extraordinarily intense consensus about the government, about the state, about the military, it was a time of really profound unity in this country. And then not 15 years later, after the end of the war, Vietnam interrupts that fundamental sense of connection to the government. And suddenly, much of the citizenry of the country, not all, but much of the citizenry of the country, develops a fundamental skepticism. And the legitimacy of the state never recovers. We are still in a period of time, and the last presidential election cycle, I think, underscores this in some very profound ways. We're still in a time when we are reeling, in some ways, from this loss of legitimacy, this loss of trust, fundamental trust, in the government of the United States. And all of the negative uh, views of, of the government, which are so abundant now in this country, go back in some way um, to this very difficult time. Of course, one of the most important uh, focal points for this skepticism and mistrust and the protest that flowed from that against the war was the draft. And those of you who were around remember that 
The draft was, of course, the principal mechanism by which Americans were inducted into the military, this flowing out of World War II and, and to some degree, Korea as well. And the focal point of the anti-war protest that, 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 uh, that erupted and was sustained throughout the rest of the war was really the draft. Uh, this was partly because young people in the United States, students especially, were exposed to the draft. But it made almost every citizen aware fundamentally of what was happening in Vietnam. And it gave every citizen a stake, potentially, in what was happening. So the war uh, really did focus protest, dissent on the draft itself. And it led, of course, in the longer run, shorter run and longer run, to the professionalization of the military, the end of the draft, and subsequent to the professionalization of the military, what I want to call the civilian military divide, which is with us still. We are living in a time of very deep bifurcation between and among those people in the United States who have experienced the military, who have been part of the military, uh, who have had that experience, and the rest of us who have not had. And the numbers are really, are really profound. Uh, some of you, you know that only roughly 2% of the citizens of the United States, the population of the United States, had any direct exposure to the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Only about 8% of the entire United States citizenry has ever been exposed to military institutions. This is a really serious uh, state of affairs and a deeply regrettable one in many ways because the experiences of veterans are becoming more and more remote, more and more abstract for most Americans, and military institutions are becoming more and more remote and more and more abstract for most Americans. So we live dangerously, I think, for a democracy in a place where and when most citizens do not have existential contact, if I can put it that way, with the risks of military involvement or with the experience of military involvement. And so as citizens, I think we are put at a tremendous disadvantage in knowing what the stakes are, what the risks are of military conflicts. And that makes, I think, our democracy uh, profoundly weaker than it was. As we think about these legacies and these negative legacies, frankly, um, we, we should also keep in mind that not every legacy from the war was negative. And I want to talk about several that I think are hopeful and positive that stand alongside these other factors, which I think put us, as I said, at some risk. For one thing, I don't think that political curiosity and political skepticism are necessarily bad things. So coming out of the anti-war movement, coming out of that time of protest, I think there were valuable things that the country learned about government, about the tendencies of government. And we might have become um, disenchanted in certain ways with government, but we probably also became more realistic about how governments work. We also experienced in that war, and subsequently, I think, in other moments of our more recent history, the power of what I want to call the power of movement politics. The anti-war movement did demonstrate, with some negative consequences, but did demonstrate the power of political movements, the power of grassroots politics. And that, too, is something that has stayed with us in some, I think, positive ways that we perhaps uh, can talk about afterwards. Third, and this is, I think, the most important thing that I wanted to say about the positive legacies of the war. Uh, the war in Vietnam was, in some sense, the beginning of advances in our understanding of the effects of war on veterans. To be more specific, it was because of the Vietnam War that we developed a growing and now much more fulsome understanding of the effects of war on veterans, particularly the long-term psychological and spiritual effects and challenges of combat experience. Of course, one of the most powerful expressions of this was the clinical, the development of the clinical diagnosis 
of post-traumatic stress uh, disorder as a part of the now Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. That happened in 1980, too late in some ways for some Vietnam veterans, but nonetheless, it was a very important step in the understanding of the effect of combat on the individuals who were involved in combat, and particularly the exposure to trauma and catastrophic stress and the ways in which trauma and catastrophic stress overwhelm our adaptive, adaptive capacities as people, leaving very strong residual effects on people who undergo that trauma. But beyond PTSD, and I think in a still more important way, more recently we have developed an additional layer of understanding on top of this clinical diagnosis which is now being, or going by the way, of the term of moral injury. Moral injury uh, now being defined in some uh, sense as perpetrating or failing to prevent, bearing witness to, or learning about acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations common among combat veterans who have violated their own moral codes when they kill or witness others killing and being killed. The discussion about moral injury is relatively recent, but I think it is one of the most important developments in national efforts to understand the experience of veterans and their experiences in war and in combat. And it all is based upon this, I think, somewhat hopeful idea that all of us live in the world with some fundamental base of a moral sensibility. I leave it to you to decide whether that moral sensibility comes from nature or nurture, an interesting conversation in itself. But the notion that all of us as human beings have a kind of moral grounding and that the experience of combat, of violence and killing-based transgressions disrupts in a very fundamental way of that moral grounding and moral foundation leading to very strong and difficult emotions and experiences of shame, of guilt, anger as central components in the lives of people who have gone through this ordeal uh, and trauma of combat. This is a very difficult subject and I think it is a very difficult one particularly for veterans to talk about. It was very difficult for me to talk about it still in some sense is, but I think it is an enormous advance on where we were just 15 years ago in talking about the legacy of combat in the lives of individuals. This sense of moral injury is, I think, leading us into a richer and fuller understanding of what veterans have experienced and subsequently what we need to do to support them. So where are we now in the wake of these legacies and these advances, as I'm calling them, in understanding veterans' experiences? We, of course, since Vietnam have had several additional wars and conflicts, depending on how you count. We've been at war for something like 25 years. And given what the president said the other day about the future in Afghanistan, we have to presume that that is going to go on for some uh, additional period, perhaps a prolonged period. So three land wars over the last 25 years. There are now in this country 2.7 million Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, depending on who you talk to and what sort of data you're looking at, something like 20 to 30 percent of these veterans the 2.7 million are presenting symptoms of PTSD, uh, traumatic brain injury, and what I'm calling moral injury. That's a big number. That's something between a mil half a million and a million people who are having these very, very considerable challenges uh, in their personal lives. That number, by the way, for me, the 30% number came from my visit to Walter Reed Army Hospital where I met with some of the physicians who were working there and worked directly uh, with these veterans. So the key question for us now in this country 
is how do we address PTSD and moral injury as pervasive conditions of individual life and experience among a very large number of veterans? What role can the humanities play in coming to terms with those conditions and experiences? How do we connect with veterans' experiences and how do we connect veterans' experiences to the population beyond the military? I think that is in some ways the most vexing problem of all because it's very, very difficult if one has not been through these experiences to grasp their kind of internal dynamics and spiritual content. And last but not least, and I think these things are all tied together in very important ways, how do we encourage the country to grapple with the legacies of recent wars and, com and conflicts? It's not just veterans who have to come to terms with these experiences. We all have to come to terms with what's happened to us as a country as we've gone through these very, very difficult uh, episodes in our very recent history. There has been enormous progress, as I think about how we address these questions, on the clinical side of the issue. And by that I mean there have been extraordinarily creative, thoughtful, helpful, um, impactful, organized medical and psychiatric interventions. I mentioned the Walter Reed Hospital, the National Intrepid Center for Excellence. This is an extraordinary program at Walter Reed. Both the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities have been involved in some of the programming uh, they've done there. But there have also been very, very significant uh, private institutional responses. One that I'm familiar with, and some of you may be, is the home base uh, program in Boston that was created by uh, uh, Mass General Hospital and the Red Sox Foundation. This is an extremely interesting and very, very effective program dealing with very, very high risk uh, situations and individuals who have had very serious issues coming out of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And there are a number, look at tonight and look at the audience here tonight, there have been a number of local community support organizations, initiatives, programs developed as response to that. And so we are making significant progress, I think, on this. Thanks to people like you and thanks to the center's program and other programs like it. But here's what I, I, I want, the most important thing I want to say tonight. The clinical world, this clinical world that I'm, I'm talking about, summons a deeper and more complex issue and task, and it's this. We have to find ways of addressing the ways in which traumatic stress and moral injury involve what I want to call problems of meaning and identity. And we have to find ways of providing resources and guidance to veterans in the search for meaning as they struggle with these powerful, strong, difficult experiences. The best way I can uh, communicate what I mean here is to tell you sort of a personal story, a brief one, but with a, with a single very important point. As Patty said, um, I went into the Army when I was 19, uh, a young, pretty immature and somewhat confused uh, person. I went through basic training uh, and on to Officers Candidate School and ultimately subsequently to Vietnam. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I was a first lieutenant uh, and this was taken in a helicopter uh, in Vietnam. I, I show the image to remind us all of how young soldiers are, most of them. Uh, when we put them in these extraordinarily difficult situations. Non-commissioned officers, or older, not a, not a whole lot older, and officers, sometimes older, sometimes not. I was an officer, first lieutenant at this moment in, in time. Um, but these are really, really young people. And that is really something that we need to keep in mind as we think about um, addressing the challenges that they're living with. 
Anyway, I, I passed a very, very interesting, complicated year in this very remote part of the Mekong Delta. Some of us were talking last night about how fortunate we were to be able to experience the war in close connection to the Vietnamese. Uh, I was an advisor. I spent most of my time not with Americans, but with Vietnamese. And I think it saved me in, in, in some fundamental ways because it gave me a richer and broader perspective of, of what was going on. In any case, I eventually finished my year there. Um, complicated, difficult, challenging, but and also very interesting year. Came back to the United States. I landed at Travis Air Force Base and um, was met there by my girlfriend and a couple of other friends. And we went the next day to Berkeley because my, one of my friends was eager to transfer to Berkeley from UCLA, where she was then enrolled. That was May 23rd, 1969. Some of you might remember what was going on in May in Berkeley in 1969. People's Park, one of the most um, what, uh, difficult and violent episodes of the anti-war uh, movement. That morning on the Berkeley campus, James Rector, a protester, was shot and killed by police on Telegraph Avenue. I had been back from Vietnam for, I don't know, 24 hours, maybe. There was a lot of tear gas in the air. And my only desire was to get as far away from that as I possibly could. So we left and went down the coast and kind of collected ourselves. I passed a very interesting summer at the University of Michigan, where the anti-war movement was also in full, incredible gear. And in the fall, I went back to Colorado College, uh, where I had the extraordinary good fortune to enroll in a class of a philosophy professor named Jay Glenn Gray. Some of you may have heard of Glenn. He was very close, by the way, to Hazel Barnes, who was a very significant person here at the University of Colorado a philosopher. I came up here during that time of returning to college to hear Hazel Barnes lecture. But here's the point of all of this. Glenn was a veteran of World War II, had been an intelligence officer in Italy, France, and Germany. And when he came back from Vietnam, this is a picture of Glenn, he wrote an extraordinary book about his experiences there called The Warriors. And one of the first things I did when I got back was I enrolled in Glenn's class and as I was enrolled in it, it wasn't about this book, but I read the book. And I came across a passage which put all of this for me in incredibly clear and helpful perspective. And it reveals what I'm trying to say when I talk about the meaning issues, the meaning challenges of these experiences. Here's what Glenn says in the introduction to the book. It is exceedingly unlikely that I shall ever be able to understand the why and wherefore of war. But sufficient reflection through the mirror of memory may enable me to make sense of my own small career. The deepest fear of my warriors, one still with me, is that these happenings had no real purpose. Just as chance appeared to rule my course then, so the more ordered paths of peace might well signify nothing, or nothing much. This conclusion I am unwilling to accept without a struggle. Indeed, I cannot accept it at all, except as a counsel of despair. How often I wrote in my war journals that unless that day had some positive significance for my future life, it could not possibly be worth the pain it cost. Now, that collection of sentences to me was the, the sort of open sesame. It was, it was the, 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 the reprieve in my life uh, that fortunately I had to be able to start to make sense of these experiences. And it taught me that for the individual coming to grips 
with the experience requires making meaning from that experience in some deeply personal way. It involves the questions and the answers to the questions. What happened to me? Who am I now? It involves a collective question. What happened to us? Who are we now? It is for the nation, ultimately and subsequently, critical to make meaning in the same kind of way. So how does one make meaning in this sense? How do you make sense of these experiences in a way that permits you to internalize it, to hang on to it, and to move on, to do something more insignificant in life? Well, as Glenn says, I think it's fundamentally a process of recollection and reflection. And the building out of that reflection and recollection, narratives about who one is, what happened, and what's next. Building a story, if you will, about that experience that pulls together the fractured elements of that experience and permits you to grasp it in a deeply personal and significant way. If you think about life generally, uh, most of the ways in which we make meaning are really involved in this process of the creation of narratives. Narratives about who we are, what we've done, where we're going. Narratives that tie the personal life to collective life. And of course, this meaning making, as I'm calling it, narrative building is where the humanities come in. Because where meaning is at issue, the humanities have to be present because the humanities mostly, most of the time, are about how we make meaning from our experience. Whether it's history, whether it's anthropology, whether it's literature, all of those forms of humanistic reflection are in the end mostly, most of the time, about meaning. And there are tremendously powerful resources in the humanities to help us do that. The narrative tradition itself, of course, out of which we build these stories of who we are. The literary tradition that gives us access to all of the rich resources of the past as we attempt to build narratives of personal meaning. And the historical tradition the stories of where we've been as a people and where we've been collectively. All of you know that some of the oldest literary works in the West are basically about combat in war, if you think about the, the Greek epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid. These are all still extremely meaningful and extremely important sources. It's because of that sort of fundamental role of the humanities in making meaning that at any age we believe that we could make a difference in working with and for veterans. And we did it in a number of different programs that we provided to the entire country. One very important one was called Dialogues on the Experience of War, where we were training individuals how to work with groups of veterans as they themselves worked to come to terms with their own experiences. So these were uh, seminars that, for training the trainers, uh, in other words, where we were trying to lay the groundwork or support people trying to lay the groundwork for the multiplication of these experiences uh, for veterans. Another uh, very important and interesting one is the Aquila Theater, which came out of NYU and the classics department there and the particular piece of that program called the Warrior Chorus, which uses ancient literature to build dialogues regarding the veteran experience, war, and service. I saw some of the productions of, of the Aquila Theater uh, in New York, and I have to tell you, they were incredibly powerful. What was really interesting about them is that the cast of the productions were entirely composed of veterans. They were the actors. Uh, they were the uh, lighting people. They were doing all of the stage management. These were entirely veteran productions. 
directed by veterans and involving veterans in these incredibly interesting ways. Another very uh, important program that we funded at NEH was called the Warrior Scholar Project. Somebody mentioned bridge programs earlier. This is a bridge program helping veterans who are interested in matriculating at four-year colleges and universities like CU to learn the ropes, if you will, of college in very intense summer programs using humanities resources as the fundamental text and work. And finally, and this is an advertisement um, for the new film on the Vietnam War by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. It's going to air on PBS on September 17th. Begin airing. It is a nine-part, 18-hour series. I have seen the series. It's extraordinary. NEH was one of the principal funders of this, though certainly not the only funder. But I had the great privilege as a first-year chairman of NEH to sign the grant that actually went to Ken's program and film. It's, it's a very interesting example of the kind of work that NEH has done on the historical side of things as we attempt to understand as a country our history and the impact and legacy of conflicts on who and what we are. What I'm trying to say by way of conclu conclusion here is that we owe our veterans thanks, but we owe them more than that. We owe them resources to build out of their own reflections and memories these stories, these meaning-making narratives which will help them make sense of their experiences. We also owe them the opportunity to share these reflections. And as they share them, we owe them our willingness to listen and to hear what they're saying. By way of conclusion, let me say just a couple of other things about the legacies of war. Recollection about combat is in part an encounter with what is terrible in that experience. But it also has to be in part about the recovery of the good things that happen in that experience, and I think that's terribly important. I learned that reading Glenn's book, and I think he was absolutely right to have a chapter on the powerful attractions and experiences that happen to men and women in combat. Those powerful factors have several dimensions, and one could talk about a lot of different things. The one that I wanted to mention in particular is the experience of comradeship, which is one of the most enduring and powerful experiences that veterans have when they consider and when they reflect upon combat. And Glenn himself was particularly eloquent about this, and I wanted to just read you a couple of passages where he talks about how we think about not just the terrible dimensions of war, but also some of its healing and hopeful dimensions. He writes, many veterans who are honest with themselves will admit that the experience of communal effort in battle has been a high point in their lives. Despite the horror, the weariness, the grime, and the hatred, participation with others in the chances of battle had its unforgettable side, which they would not want to have missed. For anyone who has not experienced it himself, the feeling is hard to comprehend, and for the participant, hard to explain to anyone else. Probably the feeling of liberation is nearly basic. It is this feeling that explains the curious combination of earnestness and lightheartedness so often associated with men in battle. At its height, the sense of comradeship is a form of ecstasy. In most of us, there is a genuine longing for community with our human species, and at the same time, an awkwardness and helplessness about finding the way to achieve it. Some extreme experience, mortal danger, or the threat of destruction is necessary to bring us together. Some extreme experience is necessary to bring us fully together with our comrades or with nature. This is a great pity, for there are surely alternative ways, more creative and less dreadful, if we would only seek them out. Until now, war has appealed because we discover some of the mysteries of communal joy in its forbidden depths. Comradeship reaches its peak in battle. 
So Glenn very, I think, eloquently and powerfully describes the ways in which this act of reflection and recollection has to include these rich human experiences of the most positive kind. One last sort of hopeful note that I want to leave you with has to do, as I mentioned, with my own return to Vietnam in April. And that experience uh, was very, very rich and very, very powerful for me. I had not been back uh, since 1969. I went with a friend of mine and the Marines in he here will be glad to hear that he was a Marine pilot uh, in Da Nang, flying combat missions out of Da Nang in support of Marines in combat in I Corps and II Corps. And uh, we had an extraordinary trip, but the end of the trip was really to the place that I had been stationed in Chowduck on a branch of the Mekong River, very close to the Cambodian border. This is about a kilometer uh, from the Cambodian border. And it included for me um, a visit to one of the most difficult and complicated uh, parts of the province in which I was stationed. This was a, a mountain in the southern part of the province of Chowduck that was occupied for most of the war by Viet Cong main force uh, battalions. And there was a lot of uh, blood and treasure shed on this mountain. It is today a state park, excuse me, a national park in Vietnam, which was pretty jarring for me, as you can imagine. Um, but one can go there and visit and see the way in which the Vietnamese, the, vi the victorious Vietnamese, are commemorating their own experience there. And this kind of picture says it all. The, the uh, flag of the Republic of Vietnam flies over the mountain. And it was, for me, a, a complicated and jarring experience. But as I reflected on the whole trip, I wrote something in my journal that I'll end with and that I hope gives you a sense of another sort of hopeful dimension of this that I came away with and I was very glad to have. I wrote in this journal, in one important way I end up with a powerful feeling that the American war and my own experience in it has been swallowed up, engulfed by nearly 50 years of history since and by the amazing energy and purpose and achievement of the country since 1975. In this sense, there's very little or nothing left of that time. Vietnam is an utterly transformed and different place from the one I knew and experienced. For me, there is both hopefulness and sadness in this, that a country so devastated by war and the titanic suffering it brought about was able to move on and to create so much is enormously impressive. Keep in mind, by the way, that three million, plus or minus, Vietnamese died during the war. But it is also saddens me to know that the sacrifices that were made here, both by Americans and especially the Vietnamese, are becoming harder to imagine, to retrieve, and to understand. Of course, deeper down in the less tangible worlds of culture and character and identity, the past isn't really gone. The war changed us, the countries and the people who fought it, decisively and forever in both very good and very bad ways. And for better or worse, the changes are now etched in who and what we are. They're part of our collective and individual DNA. I'm not sure I know now or will ever know exactly how it changed me. I was so young and so vulnerable and so unprepared for what I saw and did. Experiencing the complexity and scope of Vietnam this time around, and being better able to grasp it puts me in touch with that vulnerability in a new way. I am sure that the pressure and violence of the experience made me more anxious and fearful and cautious, but I'm also sure that it made me much more curious and capable in some important ways. The countries were greatly changed too. The war undermined, as I said, the legitimacy of our political institutions and processes in the United States, and we are still dealing with the effects of that. And our military institutions were terribly damaged as well. On the other side, I am sure that the length and harshness of the war made the communists tougher and even more rigid and that the state that emerged from the war is more severe and repressive than might otherwise have been the case. 
And yet, the country has been in some sense reborn. And its emergence from this dark passage gives me reason to hope. There was no revelation or epiphany behind these thoughts, no singular moment or dazzling insight, only another rotation in the grinding, uneven progress of perspective and perhaps understanding. That's all there is, but that's enough. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the part where we would like to have the uh, Vietnam veterans who are here. If you would like to come join us in front, we would like to have a ceremony of recognition here. If you would prefer to stay in your seats and just indicate that you're here, we can send uh, a party to you. And so we have some young folks and we have pins. And what we would like to do is have, again, the people who are veterans come down and join us in the front. Uh, or s a signal where you are. I heard so much about you. <laughs> I hope, I hope not bad stuff. Very good. Oh, yeah. good stuff. This, sorry. These are, oh, you're great places. Oh, yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, good. Excellent. That's great. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Okay, so we will have the veterans. Uh, clustered here. And again, if there is anyone who preferred to stay seated, just make sure we know that you're there so we can get a young person there. We know uh, some very good young folks here who will be passing Over. out the pins. Uh, what our custom is that we ask you to, we'll pass the mic along, and if you would just tell us your name and where you served and the time period. Uh, so we can know that about you, and then we will have our occasion of, of passing out out the pins, and then usually I just shake hands, but I really prefer to hug people. So if that's could we, if we could add that variation, <laughs> no, no we can talk about that. We'll talk about that, or we can shake hands. I will be fine with shaking hands too, but I would I would love to be part of that, and we'd like to have our speaker also uh, shake hands too with people when we when we pass out the pins. Okay, so let's go down the row. Should I have a pin? Should I help pass out the pins? No, you should. I'll uh, stay here, you okay. You get another one. Oh, well, I probably don't need another one. Roy, U.S. Navy, 1964 to 1968, 13 months in the combat zone. Uh, Pete Steinhauer, I was in uh, U.S. Navy, but stationed with the 3rd Marine Division at a field hospital out of Da Nang, um, 66, 67. And I've been back to Vietnam 27 times since 1989, work in hospitals there. And we have um, we adopted a young Vietnamese lady, put her through CU, and uh, have a, a daughter-in-law that is, a, is a, an escapee from uh, Saigon during the war. By the way, Nathan, who is passing out the pins, is himself a veteran, and so we're proud to have him in <laughs> Uh, my name is Kirk Johnston. Uh, I was drafted. I was 25 and a half years old. Did not make it to 20. Well, at 26, that's when the draft cut off. So I didn't make it. Uh, they drugged me. Well, no, I, I, <laughs> the heel marks in the concrete. That's me. Uh, I was a combat medic, 9th Infantry Division. I was there from March of 68 to March of 69. 9th Infantry Division, and I'm back. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Joe Barrera. I was uh, a combat infantryman with the uh, 4th Infantry Division in the Central Highlands of South Vietnam, uh, 1967 to 1968. I participated in the uh, Battle of Dok Tho and uh, also the Tet Offensive of February 68. And then in May, which was the worst time for me, May of 68, uh, I was uh, involved in what we called Mini Tet, the Mini Tet Offensive. You may have heard about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, here I am, and uh, I'm glad to, that I made it back. Uh, I think it was my mother's prayers that saved me, and I'm forever grateful for that. Thank you much. My name is Keith Crouch. Uh, I was drafted in January of 1969 and spent 1971 as a 1542, if that rings any bells for anybody. That's the military MOS. 
which is, uh, was an infantry platoon leader in uh, uh, I Corps. And I am awfully glad to be back. Yeah. Thank you. Dick Watson, I spoke to you before. I was an Air Force pilot uh, in Vietnam the whole year of 1968. Mike Fellows, I served uh, with uh, 65th Engineer Battalion as a company commander with the uh, 25th Infantry Division. Uh, and when I returned from Vietnam, I made the conscious decision to not get out. Uh, and each kind of assignment seemed interesting. Yeah, I hadn't been there, and before I knew it, 26 years. So served from Vietnam to the first Gulf War, and our older son served 23 years and served in Iraq. So I'm Chris Whitney. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, November 1968 to November 1969, Air Force Special Operations, Coastal Two Corps. I'm Jack Thompson. Uh, I was uh, an advisor to a Vietnamese infantry battalion up in Quang Tri province, uh, which is up along the DMZ. I was there from 1966 to 1967. I came back uh, to Travis Air Force Base, like our speaker. I, uh, I became a historian, like our speaker, at, at Michigan. I celebrate what the humanities can do, just like you do. Uh, we, we provide a story. We talk about the structure of the story, how important that is. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. We haven't gotten there yet. And it also teaches us how to ask the questions that probe and probe and probe and go deeply. It gives us literature about the experience. The uh, memorable books for me uh, have been uh, Tim O'Brien's "The Thing They Carry," "Things They Carry," mm -hmm. uh, Jack, um, forgotten his last name now. He wrote "Loon," uh, "Loon," and, and um, uh, "Matterhorn." Matterhorn. Yeah. Carl Carl yeah. Okay, thank you. So those are stories that have structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Pick them up and read them. Uh, my name is uh, Skip Keith. I spent seven years on active duty in the Air Force in uh, aircraft maintenance. I spent two years in Southeast Asia, 68-69, uh, at uh, Udorn, one of the five fighter bases that was flying support for the war. And then I went to station at Da Nang, uh, air base in Vietnam, 71-72, uh, both times as an engine maintenance specialist on the F-4 Phantoms. Um, earlier, our speaker spoke about Daniel Ellsberg and uh, the release of the Pentagon Papers. That's a critically important uh, event for a number of reasons, especially for you young people. I suggest you get the documentary um, the Most Dangerous Man in America, which is about that event, which is, has deep implications for today. I'd also suggest you go to uh, uh, Democracy Now! and look up Daniel Ellsberg to hear his interviews, because he has some very interesting things to say about what's uh, actually happening now, and the fact that we're still being lied to, which is pretty obvious about um, what's happening in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places. And I heard Ellsberg speak here in 1978 at the Glenn Miller Ballroom. <laughs> I'm Jim Hensinger, 173rd Airborne Brigade, Central Highlands, 6970. Thank you. you to come back to CC and Jill is open to it. Um, thank you uh, very much. This is
our concluding oh thank you our concluding moment here that this will continue we are uh, the the centennial this, excuse me the centennial this is 50 year anniversary continues for a while we'll have several more programs we'll have more of these occasions uh, our our notion is that we the more you will come as Vietnam veterans uh, did we miss anybody in the audience by the way who needs a pin okay she doesn't get a pin. She doesn't get a pin. But there's Carol Keeley who does wonderful writing programs. So, so okay. So uh, anyway, so we will continue. There's one a semester. Uh, we'll be back in the in the spring. We might do one on American Indian veterans next time, so that we will have the Western American tie on that. So, in any case, thank you very much for coming. And young folks, uh, please keep coming to Center of the American West events. And so, thank you.